All right, we got a great shockwave video today. Wire across equipment won't deliver. Arvin, take it away, brother. This is uh, one of these algorithms. I sing this song almost in my head. Wire across equipment won't deliver. Wire across. <laughs> and that, that whole algorithm kind of comes in my head. So it's, it's kind of nice. But th this case is basically kind of goes through, do you stent the graft or let it go? This patient had multiple um, admissions for chest pain in the past. And we've tried to stent this uh, stupid graft lesion about three or four times, but nothing would deliver around this crazy bend and stuff like that. So it, it became really challenging. And actually, the last time the patient came to the hospital, he was admitted, he was in cardiogenic shock, needed a balloon pump. He had a big end STEMI with really high troponin. So essentially what ended up happening is our heart team kind of evaluated him. They, they stabilized him and they uh, told us to uh, wait on doing PCI, start guideline-directed medical therapy. His ejection fraction actually recovered uh, by the time we did the case. And then we ended up being able to do the case without support, which is kind of nice. Dude, I love that. I just like, because this happens a lot, Arvin. Like you get these patients with bad LVs, they got multivessel disease or severe coronary disease. And I love putting them on GDMT and having, it's like, a, it's a nice Darwin test. A lot of times their EF does get better. And, you know, if it's not ACS, I think the one exception would be like ACS, right? So if someone's got an unstable plaque Lots or vulnerable them. plaque, but I do think it's a great strategy. And I have yet to lose somebody waiting for GDMT and a, and a stage PCI. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is that, is that your guy's default or is that just the exception here? That No, that was this case. I mean, you know, if someone has extreme coronary disease, I, I don't think it's a wrong answer of waiting, you try to get them on medical therapy and then then reevaluating their symptoms. And if they're still symptomatic, you know, go for it. I mean, the guy came in in cardiogenic shock. So I thought it was very reasonable to proceed with, with PCI here. He did have totally. a tail AD. His RCA was non-dominant actually. And then this CERC kept causing problems. I mean, three, four heart, hospital admissions for it. So I think it was super oh, so so he's in cardiogenic shock now, or he was in cardiogenic no. shock and now he's back? He previously was. Now the ejection fraction, uh, got before it, got it. his EF was 55% up from 25%, which is oh, which that's is, great. Yeah. So so we were all set to go ready for everything, ready for retrograde, ready for, um, you know, had two guides in. And then luckily our uh, Mongo wire cross integrate, which is fantastic, right? It just makes for an easier day. But Love we the were, Mongo. We were prepared. We were prepared for everything. We kind of confirmed that our wire was in a, a, the right spot. And, you know, it's it's way more comfortable using a Mongo wire and not having to inject anagrade. And your retrograde picture shows that the wire is in a good spot. That that makes you feel really comfortable at going forth and then proceeding with kind of your intervention that way. So, I love it. Um, this is the, the situation here where, you know, I got the wire across, but then I was able to get balloons, but I knew there was a ton of calcium. So my IVL... Uh, um, balloon did not deliver. So this this kind of goes when I when I sing that song in my head. Wire across equipment won't deliver. Um, I know these are the things to try. Right? You can increase your guide support. I'm already eight French. You know, I don't know how much I tried the guide extension. I, I really couldn't get it to deliver because there's so much calcium. You know, we did the small balloons. I did a one five two zero. Oh, you know, and how many times could I do that? You know, I didn't really pop the balloon. I didn't do the balloon assisted micro dissection, but I, I was actually across the, the cap at least. It was just, I couldn't deliver my shock wave. Um, so, you know, I could have skipped the micro catheters. Um, so, you know, rather than waiting five, 10 minutes for them to get the laser in it for it to warm up, I just decided to, um, you know, get my uh, micro catheter down and then change out for a, a rotational atherectomy wire. And then just use a 1.5 burr to kind of make room because I knew there was a ton of calcium in this, you know, old bypass case. So I felt it was uh, a nice uh, use of uh, using um, rotoblader to help deliver the IVL. To I totally agree. And I think I think everyone has such a low threshold to use rota in these graft cases. You know, that even if it doesn't look horrible, it usually feels horrible when you're trying to cross gear. And so I think that's totally the right call. And for those that have, this is an amazing paper. I reference it all the time. I think Rob Riley was the first author and um, it's basically the algorithm of algorithms, I think is what they call it essentially. And it's every possible barrier you can encounter during a case. They've got a great system for it. And I love the way that you approach this dude. I feel like this should be put up in a lot of those um, uh, cath lab rooms. It's better than a, a silly, um, you know, atherectomy device hanging on, uh, on a wall. <laughs> yeah, totally dude. All right, so here's our uh, um, rotational atherectomy. Um, we just used a 1.5 burr. 
um, just kept that uh, Corsair kind of in place um, just to kind of mark things in case something went sour or the wrong direction. But we were able to get our um, uh, polishing run here. We stored this and, and showed that the 1.5 bro was able to kind of make room. Um, you wrote a trip in now, right? Are you wrote yeah, a trip in? Yeah, to get that deep calcium. Now, here is the uh, um, uh, shockwave balloon. I actually used a, a large um, shockwave balloon. I used a 4.0 here. Um, but I kind of underinflated. I was just at two atmospheres um, at this point, but but used all the shocks all the way back. So your your pulse management, you're kind of looking at it. You're like you see this calcium everywhere. So you're like, okay, well I'm just going to use um, uh, shockwave throughout the uh, throughout the left circumflex. So this is a. So, an... Arvin, I have a question. So in the cases like this where you know there's a lot of calcium, even if you have kind of atherectomize the vessel are you going up front with a guideline in these cases or are you just kind of hoping the shockwave crosses like what percentage of these cases are you using a guideliner up front or just going I, in so with the i think i'm not i'm not using the guideliner routinely i guess it, it kind of depends on the case i mean this one i did rota so i thought that now things would deliver after a 1.5 burr um you know i think if i'm using primarily a lithotripsy strategy and it, it kind of looks funky or, or my balloon doesn't deliver easily that'll kind of you know, say, do I need a guideliner? I know a lot of folks are going guideliner, you know, wiggle up front. I think that's, that's not wrong, but I'm just trying to, um, you know, get through the day, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think Chris Brown uses almost, I don't want to say this, but I think he almost routinely uses a guideliner for his IVL cases, but I could be yeah. wrong. It's, so. I, I don't, it's not wrong. I mean, it's not wrong for sure. Cause it, it yeah. helps you. Um, and maybe it saves time in the long run. Um, but uh, yeah, here's a case that you can see. So this is after Rota, the balloon's still not expanding. So it just shows you that there's still calcium there that that uh, if you just put that stent in, maybe the job's not done. You know, that deep calcium layer usually after these these bypass cases. So um, we ended up stenting um, uh, two stents and then we stented across in, uh, into the left main. Uh, the patient had a lima. And this this graph that was really uh, challenging went to it like a diag and then a jump graph to the uh, OM. So actually, we decided to um, coil the um, that jump graph in between the diag and the um, and the OM branch. And we ended up using the um, uh, Taruma Azure coils. Um, we just used uh, six millimeter coils. We used two of them. The first time we deployed it, it was a little too close to the native vessel. So the second time we deployed it a little further, and this is just the natural shape it took. Um, and here's you can see the coils kind of coming in. And we actually used a fine cross. So, so we used a fine cross and delivered it through an 014 microcatheter. I know some of these coils, sometimes they say on the on the label that they go through an 018. Uh, microcatheter, but we don't carry 018 microcatheters in the cath lab. Someone has to run the interventional radiology, find the prograde microcatheter or something, and and go through it. But this was a nice use of of coils here. And and this question and debate kind of comes up all the time. Why do you coil it? Do you just let it let it die? And I think this this um, emphasis on you know the first time you use coils or you know your team should be ready for coils in an emergency, in a safe setting. So do, do the coils in a safe setting rather than doing it in an emergency. I so love that. Way nicer. Bill, Bill Lombardi talks about that all the time that, you know, if, if especially people who don't coil regularly, call them into the lab and say, hey, I have a, a graph, a, a, you know, a graft I want you to shut down with coils. Learn how to do it now rather than uh, in an emergency. I love that. It's Arvin, can you talk a little bit? So the Asia, you said it delivered through an 014 fine cross? Yeah, even though on the label it says um, it, you need an 018 microcatheter. Again, we don't carry those in the lab. So we just ha we have a fine cross and uh, we parked our fine cross in this graft and then just started uh, delivering through it. No issues with it uh, um, delivering or going through our, our microcatheter at all. And my understanding is the benefit of the Asia coils, while they're a little more expensive, is that they immediately get um basically like they they immediately work because they're coated in some sort of special material where yeah, it immediately closes swell. the vessel correct and they can swell more too and there's all these different types yeah i have the rep here for this one we we told them to come for this one and mm -hmm. and uh because i wasn't sure it would fit through the micro cats there but it did so that's oh, the, no. <laughs> that's a nice thing so you load the coil you load the coil on the fine cross then you use that 014 kind of pusher pusher thing correct or is so, it connected isn't it connected to something so the first thing you do is take the um uh coil out of the back and then you yeah then you have a little loader for the coil 
And then once you see the color change, like it changes from like black to gold or whatever, you'll be able to push your coil through the um, uh, micro catheter. And then once it's kind of takes its shape, you connect it to your, the Terumo I think calls it a pickle. You connect it to the pickle, make sure everything's dry, and then you just hold and push the button and then it uh, releases electronically release the coil. I mean, I'm surprised it delivered through that torturous bend in the vein graph. That was, yeah, I mean, no, that's the, impressive. The cross was there. Everything, everything kind of went, which is, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Do you bill for that? Is there a CPT code for, for billing? I, the uh, billing expert, our, our, our resident billing expert here, Arvin, is there a CPT code for coiling? I, I don't know if there, I, I bet there is. I may not have done it though. I, okay. I'd have to check on that. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that looks fantastic. Well, how'd you, how'd you deal with the OM? Cause it looks like the wire was in the, uh, the AV groove. Yeah, this one we we left it where it is, so we'll kind of reevaluate and reassess him if he needs more more work. But um, yeah, we just left the OM alone right now. That's awesome, dude. I love that. That's a great result. So yeah, and hopefully it just keeps him out of the hospital because he came in. Poor guy came in like three times, and everyone kept just ballooning this um, this uh, vein graft because his troponins would go up to like. 4,000, 5,000, then eventually like 14,000. So, I mean, it's, and 26 is the, the high on the scale. So, oh, it just shows, you know, the last time you actually got pretty sick from it. I love it. Well, this is a great case, Arvin. I think a couple of things just to take home points from this video. I think the first is, you know, GDMT works. If you have patients yeah. that are in trouble and you're worried about, you know, high risk PCI, you can always, if it's a stable ischemic disease, you can always put them on GDMT and bring them back. I think the second thing is get that paper, read it. Post it in your cath labs, like know it, you know, the algorithm of algorithms. I think that's fantastic. And then learn how to use coils in safe settings so you know how to use them in dangerous settings. I think those are kind of the, the biggest take home points that I would take. So no, I love, I love it. it, man. That was awesome. Thank you, Arvin. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. All right.